So let's uh, now try and put these ideas together on a geometric stability problem. So a failure of a system due to a geometric failure as opposed to a material failure. And what I'd like to do is look at a, a rigid link that is supported on a pin with a torsional spring with spring constant k. So the rigid length has length L and it's subjected to a force P and it's supported at the base on a pin with spring constant k. So k is a torsional spring in this case here. So look, if the, the buckling failure of the system is going to occur when it swings sideways uh, by some amount theta. So this is the this is situation we'd like to figure out. We'd like to figure out at what load value p will the system move into this type of equilibrium position. So we'll call that the buckling failure. So normally the rod would stay straight up and down. Okay. Now if I draw a free body diagram of the rod uh, in the buckled position, I have the load P and I'll have a restoring torque from the spring of K theta and for equilibrium I need some of the moments equal to zero. So if I add them up I'll have PL sine theta is equal to K theta. So this, is, this here is my equilibrium equation for my system. Now just like with the pendulum, this equilibrium equation is going to have multiple solutions to it. So in particular, uh, one solution is no matter what I pick for p, theta equals zero will uh, satisfy this equation because theta uh, sine of zero is zero and k times zero will be zero. So I'll get zero equals zero. And the solution here is the rod just simply remains straight up and down no matter what load value p I apply to it. So that's the equilibrium of the system here. Now, there's a second equilibrium here, and that's associated f with the case of theta being non-zero. And we can rearrange the uh, relationship here to say the solution occurs for p is equal to k over l times theta over sine theta. So it's just a rearrangement of my equilibrium equation over here. Now, so we have two equilibrium solutions for the system, and we'd like to determine which of these equilibrium solutions is going to be stable. Okay, And so let's go ahead and make a plot of the solution. So we'll make a plot where we put theta on one axis and the load on the other axis. And if I plot the first solution, so solution 1 here, that's any value of p theta equals 0. So that's just simply a straight line. Uh, that's the, the, the p-axis here. So that's one solution of the system. If I plot solution 2, I'm going to find a very shallow, slightly upwardly curved uh, solution path here, which I've labeled solution 2, and its intercept with the p-axis happens at k over l. Okay, so here are my two solutions. This is sometimes known as a bifurcation diagram here. And we have to decide now how the system is going to physically behave as we increase the load. Um, the, the intercept here between solution 1 and solution 2 is going to turn out to actually be the buckling load of the system. What happens physically is that if we start at zero load and start loading the system, we'll move up this axis here. And when we hit the value of k over l, the solutions actually jump off solution path 1 and move on to solution path 2. And they'll either jump right or left here. And Solution two is very shallow if you plot it exactly, and so you, if you, if you're just incrementing the loads by small amounts, maybe you're right below the critical value. You load it up just slightly above the critical value, and all of a sudden you have a very dramatic motion of the system. Okay, and the way we decide what's stable and unstable is by looking at the potential energy. So the potential energy of the system has the potential energy of the spring plus the potential energy of the load. So the potential energy of the load in this case is going to be minus PL times 1 minus cosine theta. So this distance here is simply L times 1 minus cosine theta. And so if I move, if, if I have a positive theta, the load is going to move down. So that's why we have a negative sign here. So remember that we're th the, the, the thinking here is P is some kind of static load, so you can think of it as a weight sitting up there, so there's a gravitational potential, which is just P times Z in the system. Okay, so if I go ahead and evaluate the second derivative of pi, and if I evaluate it on the different solution paths, what I find out is that the solution is stable along the vertical axis for all load values less than K over L. Uh, on the vertical axis for load values above k over l, it's actually unstable. 
And solution path two, if I evaluate the second derivative of pi on solution path two, I find out that I have a positive number. So solution path two is going to be a stable solution of my system. Um, now, this is a, a, a full nonlinear analysis of the system. I, I have these trigonometric functions sitting around and things. Um, one thing that you can do to simplify the analysis, if you are only interested in finding the bifurcation point here, or the buckling point here, is to do a small angle approximation. Because you'll notice that theta is equal to 0 as I move up the vertical axis here. And then when I approach the buckling point, that's the point where I can start to have non-zero thetas in the system here. And so one thing that I can do is do a small angle approximation on the, on the equilibrium equation and solve it in the small angle sense if I'm only interested in finding out what the buckling load is. So if I go ahead and do that, if I, if I do a small angle approximation uh, on my equilibrium equation, I'll replace the sine theta with just simply a theta. And so here's my new equilibrium equation, PL theta equals K theta. So theta equals 0 is clearly still a solution, and that would be for any value of P. So that would be solution path 1. And solution 2 would be P is equal to K over L and theta being arbitrary. So when you do the small angle approximation, you don't quite get a full solution, but you do find out what the critical value is, and then you find out that you can have arbitrary motion of the system. And that's really what you're worried about. In this case, arbitrary is a proxy for just simply large values of deflection. So let's summarize real briefly uh, what we have when we're looking at buckling problems. So the first thing to notice is, is that when we write down the equilibrium equations that they're going to have multiple solutions. And some of those solutions will be stable and some of them will be unstable. And some happen to be stable for different values of the loading parameter also. So it switches from stable to unstable. So that was the case with the, the trivial solution. Um, the trivial solution again is the case where you have zero motion. So there's no buckling types of motion of the system. So that's just a bit of terminology there. That's usually the safe condition for the mechanical system. Uh, now, the first emergence of the second solution occurs at what we call the buckling load. And that's usually the point that you're most concerned with, because the typical behavior for a mechanical system is that it's in a, in a trivial stable condition as you increase the load. And then suddenly, a second solution appears possible. and the first solution becomes unstable, and that second solution that's just appeared becomes a stable solution. And usually it's associated with some kind of dramatic uh, motion of the system and something that typically you want to prevent. Sometimes you do want it. Uh, for instance, when you design mechanical fuses, uh, people design for buckling. But uh, in general, it's that appearance of the second solution that is what's really of paramount interest. And one of the things that goes hand in hand with that is that you, one can typically make a small motion or small angle approximation when you're trying to find the buckling point because you're trying to find a second solution near the trivial solution so you're looking for small perturbations so that can kind of help with make, making the analysis quite a bit easier.